Tom Blake Slocum Jr. And it's the Orphaned Well Project, currently untitled. Excellent. Thank you for joining the Crude Life program here, or program, as we like to say in the Midwest. Uh, outstanding topic, by the way, something we've been following here at the Crude Life for a number of different years, uh, watching the increase of it. And, and the more you get to know this topic, the more complex you really see it is. And it's one of those topics that you really have to take your political blinders off. And you have to say, this is not a political issue. This is a solvable problem. And you should really be excited about being able to solve a problem. And that's how I really look at this, is that when at the end of the day, you know, what what, what Tom and I are going to talk about over the next 10, 15 minutes are the liabilities and just some of the basics of it. But from my perspective, at the end of the day, it's a nonpartisan issue uh, that is solvable. So with that as context, setting the table for the interview, Tom Slocum, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for having me. Uh, today, Jason, on, on the Crude Live podcast. Thanks for letting me join you and discuss this issue that it's been festering in Texas for uh, some time, but now it's really starting to cause some visible problems. Um, and it's and it's quite in our face out there, unfortunately. And uh, it's, it's something that the locals, at the local level, have really started to to come to terms with. And uh, we even have local city councilmen uh, running for office down there who is uh, running as a Republican who is who's begun talking about this issue. So when you have Republicans in Texas uh, speaking up about it on camera, um, you know that it's uh, it's finally starting to hit the radar. Um, and really, the big issue that we're facing there is actually an entire highway being swallowed by one of these wells. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the highway that runs from Fort Stockton to Mid- Midland, it's the main road. Um, 1053, I believe, is the highway number. <laughs> There's a, a well bore directly off the highway within about 150 feet. And uh, TxDOT, most people don't know this, but TxDOT has spent over $1.5 million on this location trying to remediate the situation but they have not been able to do a successful job because they have not um, actually hired a real team of experts that are very familiar with this type of scenario and know what it takes to, uh, to remediate it. Um, so unfortunately, the state of Texas, they don't have a good grasp on the scope of this problem. They, they never really have, and uh, there's a loophole kind of, uh, that, that exist, um, for lack of a better term, you could call it a loophole, but, uh, there's, there's a, a piece of paperwork in Texas called the P13 form. And if you have an oil well, uh, on your land and you're a property owner, chances are in your lease, you've been given the right to that well bore as part of your lease negotiation. And you can use that well bore for, water in the future after the wool company is done using it for producing hydrocarbons. Uh, so that's a common practice that's happened in Texas ever since the 20s, uh, since they invented the, the paperwork. And uh, unfortunately, there was a, a fire in Austin, uh, I believe in the 70s and the, or the 80s. I'm not sure exactly when. The Railroad Commission destroyed a lot of those records, and we don't have many of those records anymore for our reference and you have thousands of well bores out there you don't know where they are and you don't know if they were legally transferred or not but lo and behold they are being used as water wells or they were so you're going to assume that they were legally transferred to the landowners and there's no recourse uh, for the government basically if, if the landowner does not have the funds to properly plug and abandon one of these well bores there's nothing the government can do, and uh, there's no program, there's no legislation that's been written, nothing to address this. Uh, they can lobby the EPA and, and the groundwater officials, that is, in, in Pecos County, um, you know, and, and the groundwater officials around, around America. They can lobby different government groups to try to help and try to find funding for it. But uh, most times, I would say 99 times out of 100, there is no funding for these well bores. And so hence we have what uh, some 
studies have, have stated is 56,000 documented orphaned wells in America and uh, up to 750,000 undocumented well bores. And uh, some people actually believe the number is upwards of a million well bores um, due to just the level of, uh, of destruction of documents and fires like we had in Austin. In, and in other states. So unfortunately, there's been loss of records, um, not, you know, not on purpose, but it happens. And uh, so now we, 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 the situation is we have a lot of well wars out there that need attention. And uh, these are problems that don't go away, unfortunately. This isn't something if we turn our heads uh, and, and don't pay attention to it or stick our heads in the ground, per se, um, this issue isn't just going to magically disappear. And uh, no, and this is where I'm going to jump in for a second yeah. here because uh, I just want to point out a few things. Uh, number one, you know, we're talking about an interesting part that I, I never knew existed till we started t discussing some of these things with your documentary and and everything, which is the water uh, well part of it because. I think a lot of people are just getting their hands around the difference between an abandoned well and an orphan well, you know, which I guess there is a little bit of a difference. And, you know, the difference between a shut-in well and an abandoned well and an orphan well. Well, then when you fold in the water well part, that is so interesting because it, it brings in the loophole. And to me, honestly... Very, very, uh, very little times does a journalist just stand up and say, okay, I, I'm just going to take over the context of this story, which is there's politics from the past here that that needs to be just called out at some point, but now is not the time. Now is the time to say this is a solvable problem. This is a problem that obviously there's more than enough resources for. Pretty sure you can go ahead and trim some fat in Washington, D.C., to take care of a problem that is truly solvable. I mean, when you take a look at some of, of where the tax dollars are going, I mean, I remember one year Paris Hilton got like six figures in tax dollars. You know, Paris Hilton did, for crying out loud. Oh so, my gosh. Right, that's what I'm saying. So, and, and I've said for a long time, you know, solar and wind subsidies, you've been getting 40 years of subsidies and you haven't hit any of the milestones that you said you'd hit. Come on, guys, you're not hitting your own accountability. Maybe we got some room there that we can take some of those subsidies, kick them over to natural gas, or in this case, plugging and finding and taking care of some of these abandoned wells. And, you know, coming off this morning's DAPL or yesterday morning's DAPL uh, shutdown, Dakota Access shutdown because of the environmental issues, this is going to become an environmental issue too. So what we're trying to do is get proactive on this. Do you remember when the energy industry used to be proactive? They've been so reactive over the past five years. I'm very afraid that this issue is going to get out of their hands when they can get a handle on it right now. And that's why what you're doing is so important with this documentary. So I wanted to transition into the documentary um, because I think we forgot to mention that, that you're doing a documentary on these orphan abandoned water wells. That's correct. Yes. Uh, it, you know, it started out as a research on my own behalf to find out what was going on. And uh, through the research process, enough people convinced me and they said, look, you know, you need to go ahead and just find a way to film this. And uh, I finally, after this COVID business happened and the world came to a screeching halt, I said, well, there's no time like the present. And uh, I spoke to some of my friends who were uh, have, have really um, top tier positions at some of the major oil companies who, of course, can't can't talk to us and won't come on camera, but they told me specifically now is the time to do it and you should do it. And I've been pushed to film it. And so this documentary is going to show everyone in detail exactly how we got here. How did we arrive here? When were these wells drilled? What field did these wells come from, particularly that we're speaking about in Pecos County? And how many wells are like this around Texas and other parts outside of this area? Um, we actually have well bores in the water. And uh, those well bores, you know, aren't owned by landowners. But unfortunately, um, the Railroad Commission has not been given the money to plug those well bores and decommission those facilities. And uh, 
for some of those properties, those assets, what what right now is probably a thirty-five million dollar decommissioning job to to remove the jacket and take out the well bores in, in uh, you know, 40 feet of water, 50 feet of water. If a hurricane comes by and knocks it over, that's going to triple, quadruple, quintuple in, in cost, maybe even higher. It, it could, you know, exponentially grow the liability in the state of Texas every year that goes by that these very important aging assets that have, uh, you know, mechanical integrity problems and are leaking, whether it's produced water or hydrocarbons or gas, they're, they're dangerous to have out there. They're a danger to the public. They're a danger to vessels. Uh, so we, we've got assets in the water. We've got assets on land. We've got assets in the swamp, in the inland water areas, in Louisiana, all over the place. And uh, these assets are going to cause considerable damage to the environment if they aren't handled right now. And we, we do have to get ahead of the curve on this. And as an industry, luckily, I've got experts who are joining us. We've got a gentleman named Pascal Ray, an insurance expert. We've got Bill Birch, a blowout expert who helped put out the Macondo Wellfire. We've got Dan Eby from Sierra Hamilton. He has his own blowout company there. And we've got Larry Nixon as well from Great White Pressure Control. And those four gentlemen have been instrumental in helping me put this together and without their expert opinion and their expert help, none of this would be possible. So, you know, a big thank you goes out to those guys who have stepped up to the plate and we're finding more and more people in this industry that are willing to step up to the plate and talk well, about this issue at length. And, and you're going to find a lot more. I mean, just this week I've interviewed a couple people on this specific issue. I'm thinking of Kathleen Skama from the Western Energy Alliance. And she brought up a specific issue to Wyoming, which is the coal methane beds that, you know, are abandoned. And so when you start thinking it's about... A major issue. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they don't drill those anymore. And so you're taking a look at uh, other issues, too, that go you know, parallel, if you will, kind of lateral movement type issues to where the same type of uh, mindset, the same type of proactive uh, reclamation, if you will, will really do wonders for the... What what I like about this is it would do wonders for the image of the oil and gas industry, because right now it is at... visible changes. If we Yes, visible changes, yes. This is a visible I'm going to write change. that you down, actually. A real green initiative that you can actually say, hey, we spent money on this and look how much better it is. I, this is a project right here for you. This thing is shovel ready. I've had professional engineers in Texas tell me this is the most shovel ready job they've ever seen in their life. What I, what, a doubt, I believe it is. What I find interesting, too, is the, is the water connection with the water wells to where at some point, you know, somebody did whatever sleight of hand political thing they needed in order to shift the responsibility and do some other things. But at the end of the day, uh, basically, if you go to any state, it seems to me, from what I've seen now, and I could be wrong, so I'm not going to say definitive, but it's the landowner's responsibility at the end of the day that the energy company uh, really doesn't have any sort of responsibility towards. Uh, the the well after they're done with it. Have you found any instances where the operator has uh, a, a you know a connection legally or liability to that specific well that's been deemed you know orphaned or, or or abandoned? I know they have retainers, and we'll get to that in just a second. But have you uh, the, the landowner as the the liable party? Is that what you're finding too? If the well has been properly PA, which is temporarily abandoned up to the freshwater zone, and a P13 form has been filed in Texas, then the landowner is definitely responsible for it. If you can prove the well has been plugged, even if it was plugged properly back in the 1930s or 40s, whenever, um, and plugged to the uh, specifications the state requires, then there, there really is no recourse against the operator. The operator has done its duty. It fulfilled its obligation according to the law. So in most cases, operators are uh, 
prudent enough and they do take care of their properties only in cases where operators have gone completely bankrupt and there's been no recourse and for some reason the state has not had the funds has the the well gone uh, on the orphaned well list and you know the state of texas does plug uh, wells on the orphaned well list but unfortunately they only get so much money a year so some of these wells, they end up costing hundreds of thousands of dollars to plug, lo and behold. The average cost is not really $5,000 per well, as many of these agencies cite. And so if the, if the average cost really was $5,000 a well, we would have plugged hundreds of wells with the $30 million the Railroad Commission spent uh, this past year. But that's not the case because $5,000 is not the average cost. And so, and honestly, you know, what, what you're talking about is one of the main reasons why, as as a journalist and somebody who says, you know, he's pretty much non-political with his reporting, and you know, I try my best to be as you know open-minded as possible. This is one that I'm I'm pretty close-minded on, which is I see how this is going to play out. The the uh, oil and gas companies are going to get blamed in the uh, court of public opinion. The landowners are going to, you know, try to get someone else to pay for it. And um, the environmental movement's going to get upset. There's going to be a lot of bickering and complaining going back and forth when at the end of the day, everybody knows what the right thing to do is, which is let's get these things plugged sooner rather than later so that we can save money for everybody because this is a political issue from the past. It is not good to bicker about this now because everybody knows what the right thing to do is here. And and we do That's have right. funds available. We might just have to move some things around from time to time. If the L.A. Lakers and Ruth Chris can get millions and millions of dollars, we can plug a few of these wells. It's that, it's that simple. Certainly. Sorry. I, I don't mean to opine, but like I said, there's a few issues uh, that I kind of get a little bit cantankerous on, there's, sir. There's absolutely <laughs> no reason we should not be plugging these uh the amount of royalties our our government takes in from the production of oil and gas here in america is astounding and uh we have to be responsible with everything we have to be responsible with our leases our land our water these are finite resources that we're dealing with here whether it's hydrocarbons or fresh water or land we don't make any more land we don't want to have to have it fenced off like it is in Wink, Texas right now, where you have two pink wink holes. That's not what we want. We want to be able to drive down that road from Fort Stockton to Midland, and we want to be able to see where the earth has stopped moving, and TxDOT doesn't have to spend any more money trying to save that road. The options, if that road are missing, whew, we're going to have to spend hundreds of millions trying to find another road to or another pathway to build a road. TxDOT's already done the study. It's not worth it. People have to realize at some point it's no longer worth it. And if we have $2 billion of liability in Texas right now, 10 years from now, that, that number is going to be five, six, seven, eight billion. And just like the national debt becomes a problem, this becomes a problem as well, something that you can never get ahead of, get ahead of if you don't start getting ahead of it now. Uh, unfortunately, the national debt, <laughs> You know, that's more of an imaginary thing. People don't see that. This is not an imaginary thing. This is something that's liable to swallow up an 18-wheeler. This oh, the, is a, a the, situation that's unsafe. This is something that actually could get crowdfunded at certain points. I mean, because there's yes. it's, it's, such a, it's such a strong social cause behind it. It is. It is. And we'll be launching a Kickstarter soon for it. Oh, no kidding. We'll okay. Happy. Well, there you go. Yes. And we'll be happy to tell you more about that and send you a link to the web page and fill you in on everything else. But this is an exciting project. It's years in the making, and we have uh, local officials, experts from the industry, everyone coming together to find the solutions and uh, ultimately solve these problems. And in the process, we're going to put hundreds of people back to work because it takes people to go out there and do this work. And uh, people, I believe right now, much rather have a, a salary coming into their pocket rather than a, a one or two time check from the government. So uh, and this work is all done outside. You can't tell me that uh, we can't work in the oil field outside during COVID um, and, and socially distance. I'm pretty sure we can do that. It's being done right now. So 
I, I don't understand what the arguments against this would really be, um, considering how much money's floating out of D.C. right now. Five trillion dollars. It's politics. Right. Pretty hot. It's just pretty politics. Hot, Solid is. It's just politics. Yep. Uh, that's why. That, that's why I'm saying there's there's certain things where I, I feel I have to step above the politics and say, okay, let's keep our eye on the eight ball here, guys. Let's keep our eye on the cue ball. Whatever whatever ball you want to keep your eye on, it needs to stay on that one because this is a solvable problem. There's money available. It's going to have a positive. The, it, every box that you can look at has a positive check mark for humanity, the planet, the economy, the country. I mean everything. The only the, the only right. the, the only check marks that you would start checking on the other side is special interests and that's it. And so That's correct. Yeah, and and that's why I I'm I'm done with that type of uh get get involved with that. So we're going to stay on the 5000 foot view with this and I appreciate you coming on here. I'm looking at the clock cuz uh, we got just a few minutes left. Uh we're going to have you back talk about the economic job impact. I'd like to talk about some of the other states. You know, North Dakota apparently has zero abandoned wells. I'm trying to get a, a, a confirmation on that, but that that's the early reports I've got. Of course, Oklahoma has a pretty aggressive program as well. So I'd like to talk to you about the different states, what you're finding out uh, for their programs, etc. Also, uh, just kind of wrapping up here, um, You've already started filming this, right? This documentary. T- talk right. to me about uh, just the early production stages, what you filmed, and kind of what the next step is. Right. So about a week and a half ago, we made our first excursion, uh, probably my 100th excursion, back out to Fort Stockton, the seven and a half hour trip from Houston down I-10. And uh, we, we went out there and met with Ty Edwards, who introduced me to this problem initially in 2018 with a phone call. Um, he was really concerned about a well that has turned into an underground blowout swallowing the highway um, that I spoke about earlier. And so he, he joined us there, and then we were lucky enough to have another gentleman you might be familiar with. His name is Ira Yates. Oh, well, sure. And he is, he is the great-grandson of the infamous Ira Yates of Yates Petroleum. And uh, Mr. Yates is now uh, still maintains a residence in Ira Ann uh, and in the area and and, uh, has uh, a huge connection to the community. And he has started a uh, 501c3 himself called Friends of the Pecos River. So uh, Mr. Uh, Yates was able to join us on camera there next to some of these locations. And we also had uh, a gentleman from Trains Tech Cementing, Will Bautista. Uh, join us as well. So in, in just a short period of time with a few phone calls, uh, I was able to uh, to get gentlemen like that to show up immediately. Uh, it, it was something else. And uh, we also had Sarah Stogner there. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's an incredible attorney from Midland. And she was able to give some incredible, invaluable insight into this issue from a legal perspective. And uh, so we, we've got quite a, a lot of footage that's been shot there already, um, as well as, as Councilman Ruben Falcon, who's very passionate about the issue and, and, and helping the community. And uh, his race for District 74 is, is coming up and it's heating up. Um, he's a Republican running against Democrat Eddie Morales. So this issue will probably be brought up in that state rep race, I imagine, uh, if Eddie will debate Ruben, uh, we'll, we'll definitely... Uh, be hearing about this issue from both sides of the aisle from local representatives. Uh, so it's all very exciting and we're, we're lucky to have these people joining us in such short period, such short order. Uh, so many people have, have, have answered the call and been willing to come on camera and talk to us and, and tell us exactly how we did get here and, uh, and how we can get out of it. And so the story is incredible. Uh, it's, I can't wait to tell it for everyone and, and show the world uh, how much the industry does care and what we're doing with new technology to help make this a safer, cleaner oil and gas environment for everyone. So if somebody wants to reach out to you, if they got some ideas for your Untitled Orphan Well project, since you're kind of at about the 20-yard line, 10-yard line, 15-yard line, whatever you want to call it. That's right. We just got this baby rolling. 
Yeah, I mean, so you're still somewhat open to ideas, not everything, but you'd, you know, you'd probably take a look at a guest or you might even take a look at, you know, a, a state or something like that. Um, how can people follow you, get in touch with you, uh, find out more information? You know, I'm thinking yeah, of a, a, a couple people up, right up in the Bakken that, you know, are pretty active when it comes to this stuff. So just, you know, go ahead. Yeah, the easiest way to find me right now would uh, be uh, to look for me on LinkedIn. Um, my uh, name on there is Thomas B. Slocum Jr. I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, I've, I've got uh, over 2,000 followers and uh, quite the network in oil and gas. And you can uh, look for my postings on LinkedIn. And within the next week or two, we will have a Kickstarter and a website launched officially for this project. And I imagine we'll have an official name for it as well. And uh, we, we will be heading out full steam and uh, you will be able to find links to that on my LinkedIn. Uh, and we will have social media accounts as well for this project. So this, this project is just now being birthed. And uh, like I said, we're lucky to have all these professionals join us and especially my film production crew, uh, Michael Gill. I want to say I appreciate his work. He's done a lot of work in oil and gas. Uh, he's a great photographer. So it's, it's good to have people like that who are willing to jump in at such short notice uh, because they know that this project means so much to Americans and Texans and especially to the oil and gas industry and what we're trying to do to, to uh, help America and, and show America that we are responsible. 